Well, hey everybody, and welcome to another piano video here on the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. For regular viewers of the channel, you will know that vintage pianos is not a very common topic for us. And that isn't because we've got I don't know, some grudge against vintage pianos. It's mostly just that I'm usually pretty musically underwhelmed by them and so I'm not often inspired to share them. The simple truth is, is the vast majority of instruments don't age very well. And although there are some aspects of the piano which can be uh, resuscitated with sufficient time and investment, such as the action, normally once you start ripping the full guts out of the instrument, i.e. the belly or say the soundboard bridge and sometimes the pin block assembly, um, unless you're dealing with like a factory trained or even sometimes a factory in the case of say a Steinway rebuild, um, it's very difficult that you'll ever get back to the original kind of magic of the instrument. It's not impossible, there are obviously uh, you know, instances of this happening, but by and large, it's not the common experience. So imagine my delight and surprise when a couple of weeks ago, this piano wound up in our shop. It's a vintage William Canabi. So this is an American built, in fact, specifically Baltimore built, six foot-ish grand piano. It's kind of a salon uh, type size for a large a home setting or maybe a small recital size. And what appeared to have a full restoration done sometime in either the late 1990s or early 2000s. But most critically, with the original soundboard preserved. And I'm gonna to get to why that makes this instrument such an interesting find. Now outside of the soundboard, everything on this instrument has been completely rebuilt. So we're talking about a brand new pin block, we're talking about new bridge caps, and most notably, a full Renner action with a set of Renner Blue hammers on this instrument. It's also got the original ivories in stellar condition. Now, fortunately, that makes it a little tricky to get across international borders, but for anybody in the United States who knows their way around the ivory import rules, or of course, anybody in Canada, this really is quite a find. Now, Kanabi's back in their day for people who are unfamiliar with the brand or its history, was considered one of the very best instruments being made in North America at the time, which given the context of what everybody else was building around the world at that moment, uh, probably one of the best pianos in the world. Some could argue it might've been a top five piano. It's hands down, definitely a top 10 piano uh, for the moment in time when it was being built. We suspect that this example was either early 1910s or possibly early, early to mid 1920s. Amongst its various restorations over the years, uh, unfortunately, the serial number has been lost, but there's enough other telltale markers on here that at least allows us to pinpoint its original origin, the factory it came out of, and the general era that it was produced. Now, Kanabis weren't just well-known because of their quality, and they certainly were well-known because of their quality. In fact, you can find a Kanabi in Graceland, you can find a Kanabi in the White House. It is also still the official piano of the New York Metropolitan Opera. So it wasn't without a claim, but there are very specific musical features on this instrument that set it apart from other pianos, um, either of the modern era or of pianos of its day. For one, it has this really prominent front duplexing feature which is something that Steinway, of course, pushed to the back of the piano. Kanabi was really focused on getting this working at the front of the instrument. So this is a very specifically tuned section of string from the capo back to this raised brass section to give the instrument some extra uh, higher resonance, uh, sympathetic resonance when you're playing the instrument. It also has three bridges, which is not completely unique to Kanabi, but it is pretty rare. So in other words, you have essentially a treble bridge, then you have a tenor bridge, and then a bass bridge. So three different sections to optimize um, the point on the soundboard in which those strings were terminating and translating its energy uh, into motion. But another thing that the Kanabis were well known for was their low tension scale design. And this has a lot to do with why its original soundboard is still in such great condition there is just less pressure pulling down on the down bearing and flattening the crown out of the soundboard. So when you can find an aged vintage soundboard that still has crown, you're in for a real treat because that wood is at this point so elastic, so well aged, that you get into the realm of like vintage violins and other lower tension string instruments where the force is being applied to it haven't counteracted the richness that you're now getting because of the aging process. 
and the result is a piano that has so much sustain in upper color that I had to get the audio spectrometer out just to see how many partials were happening there. And would you believe 13? Most pianos have six, seven, or eight. I've seen a couple that get up into maybe the ninth partial that can really be uh, detected. This had 13 completely distinct peaks, which really explained what my ears were hearing. And here is what they were hearing. Just so much color and sustain and bloom coming off there. There's just so much soundboard tone coming at you. It's a blended sound, so you don't get that like super directional sense that you do off uh, other instruments such as, say, a Bechstein. Uh, it's kind of just this wash of sound coming towards you. But a lot more colorful than, say, the Steinway that you typically think of when you think of a blended tone. Oh, that's gorgeous. The problem with pianos is there's two things working against being able to take advantage of a really great aged soundboard. One is that the pressure that the strings exert essentially flatten the soundboard out. And once that happens, you normally lose a lot of sustaining potential and dynamic potential. But second is, let's say you wanted to use a hundred year old soundboard and put it into a new piano. The design and the shape have now changed so much that it's virtually impossible to reuse that wood and recut it into a soundboard that you could put into a modern design. So all this to say, it's pretty unusual that we can take advantage 
of a nicely aged century old soundboard. But when it happens, this is a really good example of what you get. There's a few other interesting kind of aesthetic things that catch your eye about an instrument like this. For one, you've got this, the fallboard that's kind of shaped in a way that lines up perfectly with this casework on the outside. You also have a very ornate plate design. And then of course, kind of a flower pot style leg to go along with it. Now for anybody that happens to be watching this and it is actually in the market for an instrument, we'll be sure to put the product link down below in the description. But for most of us out there who just really love instruments and pianos and everything that they represent, I hope you've enjoyed this interesting dive into a relic of the past. It really has been a lot of fun for me. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for visiting us here at Marion Pianos. My name is Stu Harrison and we'll see you back for more videos shortly.